Well, I think we can start. We had about the same before. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we will continue to our last session of the workshop with the last lecture by Joanna. Uh, she passed on uh, entanglement entropy for magnetic impurity and comparison with the field theory, but apparently she will talk about this paper before that. No, I won't talk about the paper. Okay, I just wanted to make a remark before I continue with the entanglement entropy. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, so this is this paper which I cite, yeah, and um, which is by these authors. And okay, so um, okay, so they they work in condensed matter language, obviously. But uh, I just wanted to show to you that they do exactly the same as I was doing, but then in the holographic model, because somewhere was it here? Okay. So they say representing the S moment spice. Uh, okay, so they, they have spin a half fermions here. Okay, so, so this is this is these F is like our chi, okay, and they impose a constraint. Okay, so that's very similar. And then they introduce these boson fields, which is like our field O. Okay, it's exactly the same. This is a fermion. Uh, this is an electron, and this is a, a this fermion which they in, in, introduce here. Okay, and um, <clears throat> so, and they do talk about gauge charge. So uh, both of these fields have a unit uh, a gauge charge and electromagnetic charge, and a spin singlet. Condensation of these boson implies, so this is exactly what we have, okay, condensation of these boson implies a non-zero amplitude uh, that a local moment has formed a condo singlet with the conduction electrons. Okay, and this condensation indicates that the, so I'm not quite sure what this Z2 is now, but we can certainly work this out. Um, this has entered a Higgs phase, uh, so these charges are confined and um, Okay, so they, they have a discussion of, of this. Um, so uh, it, just to point out where we can read some more about understanding the question that we discussed before. Okay, I, so, I, I will go, yeah. Did they cage the uh, UN? Well, yeah, it sounds like, but they, they are just talking about Z2. So this I have to revise why in their case it's Z2 and not U1. But um, um, no, this is not what I was not uh, I was talking about. Okay. Anyway, um, so you say they didn't gauge here. They didn't. You you see that when you represent S in terms of a fermion bilinear F delta T F, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, then the, uh, there is a, uh, I mean, the, some redundant U1 symmetry has to be introduced. And also original theory and the uh, um, fermion theory doesn't have a matching in the degree of freedom. So- this, so no, 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 this, no, no. This, uh, this is not correct. I mean, mm -hmm. this is just by imposing this constraint, you can absolutely make sure that you get the same amount of degrees of freedom. Anyway, I, I don't think we should spend too much time on this. I mean, you know, we have to think a little more about exactly what's going on. But um, so this, this I, I suggest to have a look at this as well, because, um, OK, this is condensed matter physics. OK, so and, and um, but I think from from the idea, we're doing exactly the same as they are doing. Yeah, I understand. And so I guess that if you consider this U1 as a, just a physical, I mean, the uh, degree of freedom, and then I think the, 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 I mean, the breaking the global symmetry is fine. But, but here uh, they put, uh, I was is, asking whether yeah. this, this, is, this is a physical degree of freedom or not. But here they say condensation of these bosons implies a non zero amplitude. No, no. That you wanna, I mean, the, 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 the fact that the condensed matter people use this paper doesn't guarantee that this is correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but okay, uh, fine. there is a way, I mean, there is a room that the, um, that the, I can accept your, uh, uh, what you did. 
if you consider, I mean, the uh, spin, somehow you change it into as a kind of a charge. And yeah, then, yeah, but this is exactly what they also do here. Yeah, this is exactly the same as they do here. Okay, I suggest I move on to, I, I wanted to tell you lots of other interesting things, but um, okay, maybe we can right. look at this okay, more time too. I, I, okay. I, I know this paper, actually. You know this paper, okay. Yeah. But, I okay, paper. I just want to say, I think- I don't have is... much belief on it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, uh, maybe we should think some more about this, but um, I, yeah. I, I think in our spirit is very similar to what they do. Okay, so let me go back to where I was. Um, yeah, okay, so entanglement entropy. Uh, All right, so um, let me just say again what we're doing. So the idea is to, if we were to say Anything about entanglement entropy, we need this geotaka energy surface, which will be a geodesic in ADS3. And uh, so we need to include the back reaction. So, and this is done by cutting the space into two halves. I mean, it's a phenomenological approach. And then we use this Israel junction conditions where into this energy momentum tensor, these fields little a and phi and everything on the defect enters. And that causes a positive tension of the brain. And, and that actually deforms the space. And thus, the length of the geodesic will depend on this brain tension. And the result is that the brain tension decreases when the, when the condensate forms. And then, uh, the, so the number of degrees of freedom decreases, and also this impurity entropy decreases. So, um, uh, so here you see this, the different type of space depending on the brain, uh, the, the brain tension. Then this is our numerical result from solving the equation of motion of precisely the same model that I was talking about. And now uh, we can uh, be even more precise and reproduce. So this is a field theory result depending on this. So L is the size of the entangling region. Okay, so, so L is the size of the entangling region considered around uh, this impurity spin. And um, so again, let me say that the entanglement entropy uh, is um, the difference between the entanglement entropy in the condensed phase minus the one in the normal phase, which then includes, so the difference includes the spin interaction. Okay, so now we, so this psi, so, okay, so this, this is pi squared over six temperature, and then it is, well, okay, so there's some additive constant, but it, essentially depends on the temperature and the size of the entangling region. And this uh, Xi k is the so-called condo correlation length, which is another length scale, uh, which essentially says, uh, you know, how far the screening reaches. And so this is a kind of scale, which is a parameter in the model, and we can fit, fit, fit it to something geometrical in our approach. Okay, in our approach, this is the boundary of ADS space. This is the black hole horizon. And uh, so we see uh, the brain is curved uh, due to this positive tension of these fields on the brain. And um, now we can have a kind of lower order expansion by looking at the scale D, which is, oops, sorry. Uh, so which is the, um, set by just extrapolating this. So this is the UV and the IR. And we just extrapolate here from the IR and in this way introduce a scale. I mean, you know, we could introduce it in some other way. It's just one way that uh, in, in a perturbative expansion um, about the difference between the, the scale tension at the UV and the IR. Uh, we can um, identify a scale by just extrapolating from the boundary, uh, from the black hole horizon to the boundary. Okay, so that's just how we define the scale D. Okay, so, <clears throat> so now uh, the impurity entropy, so that's true generally, is obtained from the different difference of entanglement entropies for constant tension brains, okay? So in, 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 this, um, in, in this perturbative approach, so we calculate um, the entanglement entropy in presence of 
the black hole for an entangling region L plus D, and we subtract uh, the entanglement entropy in the black hole background for just the entangling region L. Okay. And uh, so here we take, this is the resu result of uh, Rio and Takayanagi for finite temperature. Okay, so, so this was calculated by Rio and Takayanagi, so C is the central charge. This is the result that Rio and Takayanagi calculated for the black hole background in ADS3, so the BTZ black hole. Okay, now we consider the case that the scale, L, so the, we consider the case that the entangling region is very big, okay? And it, so the entangling region in particular, so the entangling region is um, essentially the entire, uh, okay, yeah. so the entire region around this impurity, which means in our, uh, in this picture, okay, we take a very long stretch from here to there, okay, in, 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 in at the boundary. And then, so L is much bigger than this parameter D, which is obtained by the difference of the brain tensions in the UV and the IR. So what is causing this brain, uh, I guess, uh, uh, tilting? The brain uh, is bent, but yeah, this is, comes from the Israel junction condition. The bending of the brain is caused by the matter fields that we have. So little a and phi, okay, the ones I've been talking about in, in these lectures. Uh, and they, so, so this is a, something like a, this brain, your so-called brain uh, is some analog of ADS2? Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, we have an ADS2 brain, yeah, okay. And, and on this ADS2 brain, we have uh, this matter content. So uh, what kind of, so ADS2 brain means that uh, it is just a zero dimensional, um, uh, object, right? In the boundary. Yes. So what can be there at that point? Is that the uh, just a spin of the impurity? Or what, what do you have in mind? Well, I have exactly the same model in mind that I introduced yesterday. So um, we, we just work exactly with the same model that we had before. Hmm. The only thing is now that we include the back reaction on the surrounding geometry. So this is the intrinsic curvature in the ADS3 space surrounding this ADS2. Okay, and here it's just a way of depicting how I impose the back reaction. Okay, so by using this um, uh, it's a very junction condition. I mean, you can also just say, okay, I have my ADS2 brain, I put T mu nu on this. And then from solving this equation, I see that my space is not directly ADS3 anymore, but it gets deformed through the spark reaction. Mm. And now depending on the temperature, the condensate is small or big, and the bigger the condensate gets, um, the, the less the tension is. And it's okay, that, that was what I was... Uh, saying here, the larger the condensate, the shorter the geodesic. Okay, and because the geodesic is the measure for the entanglement entropy, it means the larger, the lower the temperature, uh, the larger the condensate and, and the, the, the less tension is on the brain. And this, for that reason, um, you know, the entanglement entropy gets smaller. Okay, and you see this is a very little curve. And so now as a kind of approximation, I, I put a, I mean, so if the, if the tension is zero, this will just be a straight line, okay? So, and if we, but of course our field depends on the radial coordinate. That's why there's this bending. But I can just approximate by putting a straight line here and approximating here by a tangent here. And this will give me this parameter D. Okay, so the fact that this, the bending is not uh, just leading to a straight line comes from the fact that phi depends on the radial coordinate. So this, uh, I see. So phi is a contributing to T mu nu? Yes. So what is physical interpretation of this uh, uh, 
again, I mean, the team you knew um, Well, it's interpretation in the gravity side. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Um, so because um, this, I know that if I want, so the, the simplest way to include the back reaction of this ADS2 grain on the surrounding geometry is to use this Israel junction condition. And that's the extrinsic curvature of the ADS3 space. And, and this is um, the energy momentum tensor on the brain on the ADS2 brain. So I mean that in terms of the condo physics, so mm -hmm. we need to identify what is the, t because T mu nu is a source, right? We need to specify by physical conditions. So yeah, I, the physical I, condition is, I, so I calculate zero, zero. Let's I, I calculate zero, zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay. Uh, Which okay. is energy. So what that energy is uh, on this uh, hypersurface? Okay, so so I suggest you to look at this paper because there we ah. have a lot of detail <laughs> about. Okay, let me just explain. So you know we we investigated. So if this energy satisfies the null energy condition, and the weak and the strong energy condition, and so on, and um, so I think it has to be. So the, you want this to be a monotonic function. What you don't want is that this covered big thing curves back to the boundary. And, and for that reason, this energy has to satisfy the null energy condition, I think. Yeah, there um, is uh, conditions to satisfy, but just uh, uh, I am asking for what physical content is contributing to this energy? Well, the energy momentum tensor that we calculate from our action. We have an action, so this is the one I looked at the entire lecture. Okay. We, we, we do have explicit physics there to describe, right? Which is a yeah, but I have an explicit action. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have my my favorite. Okay, so where is it here? Okay, sorry. Uh, ah. This is my action. Okay, I take this action. So this is the action I've been talking all along. From this action, I can calculate an energy momentum tensor on ADS2. And this is the one that I use in this uh, um, Israel junction condition. Yeah, right. The, 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 you need to calculate what is the FMN and the FMN and the. Yeah, yeah, but I know what these are. This is a just, <laughs> this is just a Abelian gauge fields on the so little f. Okay, so again, little f is the gauge field, uh, the field strength tensor for the gauge field on the ADS2 brain. Capital F would be the energy momentum tensor for um, for this field, but that doesn't contribute. I just want those fields which are on the ADS2 brain. So I'd calculate the energy momentum tensor for this brain. So there's this complex scalar and there's this gauge field. And, and the, this is, Everything is well defined. This is the action I work with. Okay, this is the model I like. I want this action. And then I just calculate the energy momentum tensor and I insert it into the Israel junction condition. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, so what is the FMN square though? Let me see. B squared. Well, FMN is the field strength tensor for this fillet field, little a. Okay, so let me just. I mean, I, I'm asking about the just uh, not, I'm not talk, I'm not asking about the mathematics. Uh, but I'm just no, the meaning, me. okay, so the 2D gauge field A, the, its time component is dual to the this chart of this symmetry that we discussed. I think that many times. Oh, what I mean is that this is created by something, right? This F is sourced by, I think the U sourced by JT, and the JT was the uh, nothing but what? Spin, you, you agreed. So maybe yes, 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 yes. Okay, so th this is the charge for this yeah. U one symmetry. That is the spurious symmetry. Right. So oh, and for this we have a two D gauge field, and its time component is dual to um, um, the to the charge density. So that's pretty standard in ADS-CFT. We just apply it to this particular case. Okay. And then for this gauge field, I can calculate a field strength tensor, and this field strength tensor is called F, little f. And little f is in my action there. 
And then for this F now, I calculate the energy momentum tensor. Right. Um, so where, uh, what is your, so the source is at the boundary and then the field is uh, along this, uh, uh, I mean, the bulk of the ADS2. Yeah, yeah, so this energy momentum tensor is, is a gravity energy momentum tensor, which is calculated in the bulk of the uh, geometry. So in AD, on the ADS2 brain embedded in this ADS3 space. So this is a this is a gravity energy momentum tensor for my gravity action. Mm. Okay, so so okay, good question. So uh, let me go back to where I was. Mm. Uh, sorry, I wanted to ice. Uh, yeah, it is okay. This is a gravity energy. So this is equation which holds on the ADS two brain. So it's a gravity equation. Okay. So this is the intrinsic curvature of the ADS3 space, which is here and there. Okay, and so the extrinsic curvature then gives you some expression for the curvature of this boundary. And this is a gravity energy momentum tensor, which I calculate from this action that I just showed to you. Take no, this I action. The must be coming from metal, not from gravity. Yeah, but it is coming from the matter in the gravity space. That, that's totally okay. <laughs> I can just calculate. Okay, sorry to have. This is my gravity action. Mm -hmm. And from the point of gravity, these fields, which are motivated by the ADS CFT duality, they are matter fields because the background is this Einstein Hilbert action. But now I'm looking at the back reaction of these, these matter fields, which are yeah, in the gravity that state. That's not a problem. The... Okay, that's okay. Just I'm. I, I, I'm asking uh, 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 what, what, what is it creating FMN and then you just answer. Wait, but this is spin. exactly the same model as I've been discussing for the last three lectures. Okay. <laughs> I'm just taking the model that I've been discussing and I calculate its energy momentum tensor. Yeah, That's but the uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, here everybody is very new to, I guess, uh, this. Uh, yeah, 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 but this is why I explained, I explained one more time. I take this action, okay, and I calculate its energy momentum tensor on the gravity side. And uh, so I precisely use the same dictionary that I have been using. Okay, so the electron current is due to a gauge field in ADS3. The charge uh, for these uh, spurious fermions uh, is due to a gauge field in ADS2. And, and then I have this operator that condenses it's uh, dual to a complex scale of phi. So A and phi are my fields on the ADS2 space. Okay, so, and then I motivated this action and I said, okay, we want now this matter action. And this matter action, so, so far I just solved the, these equations of motion in the probe limit. And I had this discussion about the condensation and so on and so on. But now I do the next step and I say, I want to see the back reaction of these fields on my geometry. And the way I do this is by using this uh, Einstein, uh, sorry, this Israel junction condition. Okay. So could, could you go to the your equation of motion where you describe the, uh, that there's a very nice equation of motion. So. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, I have them. Okay, so they were in this other file, so I have to find them again. So the only thing I not need to know is the whether, yeah. So JT, yeah, that's the problem. I, my problem is that JT is uh, depending on R. That means that yes. you do have a bulk source, right? Yeah, and this is about force, this, yeah. This cannot be calculated from anything else you need to specify what that is I don't you can calculate that. the f right but you cannot calculate the j out of anything why not else. i i can just i can solve. solve so you need to specify the bulk source and i am yeah but this here yeah, this is the bulk source, source. these are the bike fields at and phi are the bike fields this is just okay. This is like the gravity equation of motion. All right. So we you have a, a phi of R. 
So I have phi and A are gravity uh, matter fields in the gravity, so they depend on the radial coordinate. So it's a charge in the phi squared. Huh? So do you have a, a equation of motion which is a determining phi? Yes, I do. I didn't. I, I'm really sorry. I didn't write it down. <laughs> I oh, should okay. have. Uh, it's in the in the. If you look at I, this, I, I, now, I that, can imagine that the uh, maybe some such uh, nonlinear equation coupled nonlinear equation can give you phi. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so good, thank you. So so um, I'm just okay. So I can okay. I I'm very sorry. I should have write, written down the equation of motion. This is for phi. I, I I'm sorry. Oh, I understand. Um, okay, so there's equation of coupled equations of motion which come from this action. Okay, and so far I solved everything in the problem. It right as you so, say, uh, this is completely analogous to superconductivity theory. Yes, you are right. Okay, so okay, let's go back to the entanglement entropy. So I take this action, and from this action, I calculate the gravity energy momentum tensor. Okay, sorry to I have to jump the stuff of yesterday. <clears throat> okay, so again, I'm using this equation. So for this T menu is calculated for this action, which I just showed you. Okay, and so this enters this Israel junction condition. And so this determines the extrinsic curvature of the ADS3 space, which is on the two sides. Okay, so then I'm gluing this together subject to this condition. Where the matter is the matter that um, describes my condo model, my holographic condo model. Okay, good. All right. So now, um, if I have this back reaction, I can calculate the change in the length of the geodesic. And if I calculate the length of the geodesic, then um, if I form this difference, then I can calculate the so called impurity entropy. Okay, so and that's what we're doing now. Okay, um, so and so again, going back to this picture, again, I solve the equations of motion, especially also this equation of motion for the phi. Okay, and um, then I put this into the Israel junction condition, and this is what I get. So, oh, just one more question is mm -hmm, uh, sure. you said that the presence of a phi condensation is a bending, right? Yeah. But what determines this angle? Well, the tension which comes from this energy momentum tensor. Okay. Which is determined so, by? I solve the equation of motion. Yes. That determines phi. Phi depends on R. And then I just take this phi that depends on R and I insert it into this equation. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, but I, I, Juliana, <laughs> you do have a physical system, right? Condo physics. So, um, at the moment, I'm just talking about gravity. Okay, I, I I'm just solving my model. But That's the what gravity is nothing but a tool. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but okay, the, my logic is, let me explain the gravity calculation. Yes. And I, the claim I'm going to make is that. The, the impurity entropy that we get from the gravity using the Rio Takahanagi formula in this yeah, way. Yeah. It's all fine. What I'm asking is uh, what determines, so in gravity language, what determines this angle? You see that, can you show me that? The, is right, this equation determines radius, uh, uh, Yeah, here, okay. This Sorry. equation determines the angle because this phi that enters T will depend on R. So for different values of R, I get a different extrinsic curvature. Yeah, that's fine. Angle. So can you show me that the very that the few uh, previous one? Uh, maybe we can postpone this discussion to and here. I okay. okay. Maybe we can. We should postpone. Okay. So <laughs> this line is exactly. This line, but this was just, you know, this is an explanation and this is a true solution to the equation of motion. Phi depends on R, this means T mu also depends on R, and this means the extrinsic curvature depends on R. And if the extrinsic curvature depends on R, it means that this line is curved. Okay. 
And my physical motivation is that I'm now looking at this gravity model and I'm calculating the entanglement entropy or impurity entropy using the Rio Takanagi formula in this particular setup. And the result will be that it coincides with some field theory result for large and conformal field theories that's been known for a long time. Okay, so this is the logic. Okay, so this is the field theory result. And all I want to show is that using what I'm explaining here on the gravity side, I can reproduce this equation. This, okay. So this is a well-known result for large and conformal field theories, which has been around for some time. So now I said to, to get this result, I, um, I, introduce, I have to introduce a length scale to, to uh, because they have a length scale, which is a kind of physical length scale in the field theory model, which is this combo correlation length. So, and we define a geometrical length scale, which is this distance between the point where the brain sits in the UV, and this extrapolation, linear extrapolation of the brain in the infrared. And the brain is curved because phi of R depends on R. And this means that the brain will also, the brain curvature also depends on R via this Israel junction condition. Okay. Good. So now I calculate the impurity entropy from the difference <clears throat> of the entanglement entropies for constant tension brains. Okay. And then this means I can use this Ryo Takayanagi result for finite temperatures. And I consider the difference between um, the Ryo Takayanagi result for uh, this enhanced entangling region, where I have this parameter D entering, which comes directly from this curved brain, and the, the original entanglement uh, region. Okay. Now, if this parameter D is very small, this means I take a very big entangling region, then um, just plugging this into here and expanding, we get this result, okay? And now if I take the freedom in context of ADS-CFT to uh, that this scale D that we geometrically defined, is identified with this condo correlation length that the field theory people have, then I get exactly the same result. So, so this result exactly, I, or there's also a, this two pi over third and so on. Uh, this agrees with, um, with this. Okay, so I mean, I have to choose a factor of uh, two or, um, over pi or something, that's, that's fine. So, so we, if we identify the scale as being proportional to this D, then um, the calculation on the gravity side agrees with the field theory calculation. Okay, so, and this is at least, it's, it gives us a nice feeling because our gravity calculation matches the field theory result. So in the context of ADSFT, this gives us, uh, you know, some support that we are doing something which is meaningful. I mean, that's the usual way that things are done in ADSFT. And okay, so I think it's quite non trivial that we managed to match this uh, CFT result, which is really obtained again. You know, in ADSFT, they, they, um, so if you do a pure CFT calculation of the entanglement entropy, you have to use this um, um, replica trick and so on. And so it's a totally different calculation, but this geometrical calculation that I showed to you reproduces this field theory result. I think that's pretty non trivial. Um, okay, are there any other questions about this? Um, because I know I'm, I'm going to move to something else, if that's okay. Um, I mean, so so for the for the last hour, what I was planning to do. So first of all. Now we discussed at length this model, um, okay, with this action that I wrote here, okay, so which we now looked at many, many times. Um, this one, okay, so, so um, everything I did for this was to solve the equations of motion of this model in particular disguises, okay, and I showed you that we can, by doing this, at least reproduce quite a few features. Um, that, that also appear in, in the context of condo models, but slightly beyond because we have these strongly correlated electrons, okay? So 
I showed you the quantum quenches, I showed you the covalent functions, I showed you the this impurity entropy. And um, so here also for the last calculation, it's actually quite interesting that um, our calculation, which is for strongly coupled theory, matches generally this um, field theory result, um, which was obtained for just conformal field theories without specifying whether the coupling is big or not. Okay, so so we have, I think this shows that this model has um, some success because um, we can can um, make some interesting physical predictions and uh, also explain say the screening and, and the phase shift. And, and so, so in, in that sense, we feel that this model makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. So, but I also mentioned some problems about this model in particular to um, in relation to the one over n uh, dependence, which we kind of adjusted manually a bit when going from the top down to the bottom up approach. And for the top down, this approach, the top down approach was useful because it allows us to identify the fields in the field theory side. <clears throat> and uh, now here, um, um, uh, we, the, it's more simple to, to use this bottom-up model. Okay, so but now let me very briefly show you this model. I, okay, this will be an, yet another, another half an hour, an hour and a half to 90 minute talk about this model, <clears throat> which is this model, uh, which I wrote with uh, <clears throat> the paper, which I wrote with Charles Melby Thompson and uh, Christian Norte uh, two years ago. <clears throat> okay, so, and I don't want to go into any details because it will be very technical again. I just want to tell you that it exists. And this model has some features which solve some of the problems that this previous model has, okay? Namely in terms of the uh, powers of N in, in the various terms that contribute uh, here. Why do I have this strange thing on this side? Yeah, that looks better. Okay. Um, okay, so here, <clears throat> this is a totally different model, which is based on this D1, D5 CFT, which is also a well-known CFT uh, in the context of um, ADS CFT. <clears throat> and it, it's very, very closely again related to this CFT formalism that um, um, I introduced before. Now, okay, so these are some results that are already known for some, some time. Okay, so, um, so two days ago, I was in the context of CFT discussing this boundary RG flow. Okay, so the, because in the quantum model, the coupling is only to some boundary, or so some localized degrees of freedom, which then can just be traded for a boundary condition. And, um, and uh, in fact, the condom model can also be viewed as a special case of a boundary RG flow in this so-called westermino witten model. And essentially what this is, is a conformal nonlinear sigma model on uh, the space S3. And uh, there are some units of uh, three-form flux through this S3. Okay, so in, written in this kind of stringy language. And um, okay, then, um, the, the boundary conditions uh, are, are, that preserve this conformal symmetry are, are classified by, by the spin J. Okay. Um, so now there's, so this is some result from conformal field theory, which nevertheless involves D0 and D2 brains. And so what people in conformal field theory do, they describe such a renormalization group flow. <laughs> that originally you have a D0 brain, which is just some kind of point, yeah, and uh, which sits at the North Pole of this S3. And so this in the UV, so in the UV of this RG flow, uh, the, the D0 brain just sits here at this point. And then in the process of this uh, um, RG flow in the infrared, um, this point becomes a circle which slides down, so it becomes this red line which slides down uh, on this S3. And um, so, and there's a, a final point where it has to stop. And this uh, is determined by this angle theta. 
And uh, theta is involved with the spin J and also uh, the, the units of ducts here, K. Okay. So, um, so when essentially when this number is reached, the, the flow uh, just, uh, just stops. Okay, so this is a field theory <clears throat> picture. And so in this paper, which now I don't have really time to discuss, uh, we found a gravity dual realization of this. So if you have a D1, D5 system, <clears throat> then uh, this leads directly to an ADS3 geometry. So remember in this previous model that I discussed for you, we had the, the D3 brains in the background and we had both D5 and D7 brain probes and they were, we are interested in the action between them, okay? And now in this case, <clears throat> we don't have such a background, but uh, this D1, D5 system directly creates this ADS3 space, okay? And then in the other 10 dimensions, we can have a sigma model and in particular, we can have this S3. And so we can have this sliding down. So this, this is a kind of so-called Myers effect. So when this D0 ring become D2 brain, and so we can construct an RG flow uh, where we geometrically in gravity uh, realize this flow. Okay. Um, so, um, so this can be viewed as precisely this absorption of the boundary spin as we were um, discussing. So there's an RG flow uh, between these two types of boundary condition. And so adding the spin coupling results in a non-abelian polarization. And so the D0 brains become uh, D2 brains. And um, so this has been discussed in the context of the CFT description of the condom model. So this corresponds to this absorption of the boundary, boundary spin. Again, by Affleck and Ludwig, which I mentioned before. Okay, so um, again, um, we can use this technique of fusion. Okay, so, so fusing representations of the UV Gibbs and representations in the IR. And uh, again, we have here our uh, operator where S and uh, J interact. So that's very similar um, to, to what we had before. <clears throat> and another nice feature now is that we can make this current um, not, it doesn't necessarily have to be an SUN current. Okay, it can be this is SU2. And um, okay, so, so this is what I described to you. And I just want to dwell on this very last line now before, um, to, before I conclude this kind of side remark. Um, oops, sorry. I hope you can read this for some reason. Behind this, can I move this to the side? Sorry, I just think you can't read it. Okay, let's do it like this. Okay, so the goal. So what we did in this paper with uh, Christian Notte and Charles Melby Thompson is we use a top-down holography again to study defect flows exhibiting a similar characteristic than this puffing up of this uh, D zero into D2 brains, okay, but okay, so that would be in type 2A, now we go to type 2B, but so we have this D1, D5 CFT, uh, which creates an ADS3 dual space uh, together with an internal S3, and then we study RG flows characterized by this non-abelian polarization, okay. And uh, so th this is a very stringy thing, and I, I don't want to go into all these technical details now, but if somebody is interested, I, I recommend um, this to look at. Um, okay, so here again, just to show you the table. So if we have um, D1 runs in this direction and D5 in those, then we get a CFT, and the CFT will give us an ADS3 dual right away. Okay. Good. This was just a, a side remark I wanted to make um, to say, okay, you know, I presented to you this model, which I st studied for quite a while with many collaborators, but now we have some new model, which um, is slightly more elaborate. I mean, it's also a little more technically involved, but um, it, it solves some of this order of N problems that I was mentioning before. Okay, are, are there any questions about this? In Okay, 
So now, if you allow me for, for the last uh, 40 minutes, I was going to move to something slightly different, although it's also um, it's also very much related. So let me just stop sharing this. Um, and uh, in particular, I wanted to move to some more recent paper and uh, some things that are maybe a little simpler to, to understand than what I was uh, talking about, about in, in the last five minutes. Uh, so let me sh share the screen again uh, with something else. Yeah, okay. Uh, can I get some? Yeah, okay. Can you see this? Mm. Yes, we can see. Okay, very good. Okay. So I talked a lot about the condom model. I hope you, you got some feeling um, how this actually works, the things that we can do, and um, you know the nice uh, matching between the gravity and field theory that we get, and so on. Uh, but to to end with, let me talk about something a, a lot more recent. Okay, so the paper which we wrote in last uh, September, which will also talk about spins, but um, you know at the at the beginning there will be no electrons; it's just uh, interacting between two spins. Okay. But it's also again in context of holography, and um, so this paper is interesting for the fact that um, we really teamed up with some condensed matter physicists, uh, Flavio Nongira and Jeroen van den Brink. So they are at this Institute for uh, Theoretical Solid State Physics at um, the Institute for Material Science in, in Dresden. And so this was motivated by our, the fact that we are jointly in this uh, new um, research program funded by the German federal government called Complexity and Topology in Quantum Matter, and uh, which is a joint initiative between Würzburg and Dresden. And um, so we were incented to have collaborations um, between the two places. And so it's very nice that actually we managed to write a project together with some people working in material science. So I thought you might be interested to hear about this because um, it's uh, it's in, in this context of making connections between ADS CFT and condensed matter physics. Okay, so now here um, there's quite well there's some relation to the condom model, but also it's just a, a slightly a different model. And uh, so so. Um, let me read the following to, to you. So we establish a relation um, between entanglement in simple quantum mechanical qubit systems. So that the model that we consider is um, actually um, a model with just two spins that interact with each other. And uh, the idea is that uh, a similar structure also arises in, in wormhole physics in the context of ABS CFT. And um, so now what we do is to characterize the entanglement between states um, is to use some topological quantity, which is the Berry phase. Okay, that was also coming up earlier already. Okay, so we will look at the Berry phase. Hello, Professor. Yeah. I want to ask you one question. In your abstract, you wrote about the local measurement. Did you need to need a local unitary operation. Yes, exactly. Yes, there will be local unitary operations. Um, thank you for the question. I, I will I will show them to you in a minute what these transformations are. Yes, very good question. Thank you. Indeed. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so there will be uh, uh, unitary uh, operations. Okay. So, and we will have states with the same entanglement structure, but they have nevertheless uh, different um, topological properties and different very phases. And okay, so, so on one hand side, this feature can occur both in simple quantum mechanics system, like uh, just a like simple qubit system. And it can also appear in, for, for wormhole like structures. And um, so the nice thing is that uh, from the gravity, uh, sorry, from the from the quantum mechanical point of view, uh, this can actually be realized experimentally. So, so we have some suggestions about this in, in this paper uh, by our colleagues from condensed matter physics. And uh, okay, so so uh, I will show you what these uh, operations are uh, on the um, in, 
in this quant simple quantum mechanical system, and I show you uh, discuss briefly what the relation to to wormholes is, and because um, there these transformation correspond to time evolution on the two sides um, of the wormhole. Okay, very quickly, uh, let me remind you what the very phase is. Um, so uh, consider the time-dependent Schrödinger equation, uh, which has a, a particular ground state. Okay, and uh, then the Berry connection is some generalized gauge field um, that that is defined in this way. So here we have this basis. So so n are some basis states. This is a unitary time evolution, and lambda is a, a parameter that parameterizes the state. So assume that we have several of these parameters, then we get an index i here. And um, so the, the connection is defined um, as the derivative with respect to these parameters uh, of, of the ground states that we have. So, uh, so for instance, if you know time evolves around a closed loop, like in this picture here, uh, then of course these parameters lambda are going to change. And this change then will enter a connection in the mathematical sense. Now, just plug plugging this object into the Schrödinger equation, uh, we get this equation here, which tells us how uh, this um, unitary evolves with time. Okay, so this leads to this differential equation here. And um, uh, very similar to uh, what we discussed briefly in the last lecture. Um, then, um, so there's a phase uh, which is obtained from integral around a closed loop parameterized, for instance, by the time uh, of this expression here. And so, as we will see, an interesting feature for us is that um, there will be a singularity here. So, so um, th that's an example for, for a very phase, and, and now we have. In, in some sense, a, a Dirac monopole, but I, I should warn you that this is a picture in the space spanned by the magnetic field. It's not a picture in this in real space. Okay, so um, it's a it's a different um, a different uh, slightly you know uh, meta structure where we are in this um, slightly abstract space. Okay. And um, where there's actually an interesting relation between the fact that there's a singularity here because this phase will be related to a symplectic form. Okay, so a two form, which is related to this Berry connection and this two form um, will be non-exact at this point. And the fact that this uh, integral is non-exact is also related to the presence of this uh, singularity, this non-exactness of the symplectic form. Okay, so the upshot of this paper is that um, um, we calculate the Berry phase for an interacting two qubit systems of two spins in quantum mechanics. And we show that states with the same entanglement uh, that we can just, we can calculate the entanglement entropy just by hand from looking at the density matrix. Uh, this may have uh, different Berry phases. And um, so mathematically, the Berry phase is described by this uh, non-exact symplectic form. And uh, so the result that we find for this two qubit system can actually be probed experimentally. And then from the point of view of the holography and, and ADS-CFT, uh, the interesting fact is that uh, wormholes share the same mathematical structure that we see here with the Berry phase and um, the non-exact symplectic form. Hello, Professor. I have one question. Mm -hmm. You said a state. Yeah, sure. uh, did you mean a pure state? Uh, I will show you the state in one second. Okay, I have. I, the, okay, I, I will show you. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I will. Okay, so here will be the state. Okay, let, let, let's just go through these two slides, and then we will, I will talk about the state. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I will answer your question in, in two minutes. <laughs> Okay, um, so why is this interesting from the perspective of ADS-CFT? Well, because uh, in ADS-CFT, there are relations between entanglement and geometry. So you can consider a wormhole in a global ADS space. Um, 
um, where, uh, according to this ER is equal to EP, EPR proposal, um, a geodesic um, linking the, the two ends or the two sides of this uh, global ADS space um, uh, um, correspond to to to, ent uh, to entangled states. And uh, so I also would like to advertise this paper of Hermann Verlinde um, um, from last May, where he shows that this concept of a wormhole is also present in, in simple quantum mechanics. And uh, now the new result that we have is that uh, the very phase provides an understanding of how degrees of freedom entangle to give the full Hilbert space, both for the quantum mechanics system and also for the wormhole. And uh, so there's, there's this issue of factorization. I mean, when do Hilbert space factorize? Okay, so that also relates to this question of whether the state is pure and so on. Um, and, and this is also an important question for a semi-classical description of wormholes. Okay, but now let me turn to this uh, simple model in quantum mechanics that we consider. And uh, so the, the upshot will be that this model shares some very nice features with, um, with black holes. Um, so um, this is our model. So, so it's a model involving two spins, two spin a half particles. Okay, so uh, here's a Hamiltonian. So, and the important point is that these spins are coupled to each other. And uh, then one of these spins is placed into a magnetic field. Okay, just one of them. Um, okay, so this can experimentally be realized, for instance, by the electronic Zeeman interaction in a hydrogen atom. So in, in, in hydrogen atom, we have well a proton and an electron, and they, they have spins. Um, and then we can make the Bohr magneton um, uh, of the electron uh, very different from the Bohr magneton of the proton. And then um, we can just uh, consider um, just this electronic Zeeman interaction here. And so just the interaction of one of the spins with, with the magnetic field. Okay, so um, now here um, we choose um, we chose the, the spin to be parallel to the magnetic field. So there's this external magnetic field. And um, so in fact, um, this can be realized if we take some particular unitary transformation. Okay, so which there's a symmetry that we can use to, to um, make the term of this form. So to turn the spins to be parallel to the magnetic field. And so uh, the unitary transformations that bring us to this particular form of the interactions, they are of this type here, okay? So um, they depend on two angles, um, uh, which are uh, on, on this sphere associated to the SU2 uh, symmetry. And um, so um, there's, so acting just on the first spin, uh, we have one, term here um, on the Z component, on the Y component, and again on the Z component um, of the spin operator with angle phi and angle theta. And now uh, we have to be a little careful because if we have the sphere on with spanned by phi and theta on which we rotate, then there's two patches, the North Pole and the South Pole. And uh, depending on which patch we are in, in one uh, there's a we have to identify with a plus sign, and the other one we have to identify with a minus sign. Okay, so by using this unitary transformation to act on this interaction term between the first spin and the magnetic field, we can always bring the interaction into this form. Then the second spin, since it doesn't interact with this magnetic field, uh, we can transform uh, however we like, okay? And uh, so what we choose is to uh, introduce a parameter lambda, which goes from zero to one. And we just turn the second uh, spin by just a fraction of the, this first uh, transformation, okay? So we look at a total unitary transformation acting on the first and on the second spin, which is essentially just the product of, of these uh, two operations. So this acts on the first spin, this acts on the second spin.
Okay, so now we can calculate the ground state of this model. I hope this will answer your question that you just asked. Um, so now we can introduce this notation of quantum mechanics where we have a, um, an angular and a magnetic quantum number. And we use this to label the, the singlet and the triplet states. So the singlet, this is um, the singlet when uh, S is equal to zero, but then when S is equal to one, we have a triplet state. So then this can be plus one, zero and minus one. But then it can be shown that the ground state uh, takes this particular form, okay? And uh, so there's a parameter alpha here, which is related to the Bohr magneton, the, the mod of the magnetic field that we apply and the coupling. So let me just go back to the previous slide. So we have the Bohr magneton, the, uh, the mod of the magnetic field, and here's the coupling constant. Okay, and these three things together, they, they enter this parameter alpha here, which appears here. Okay, and then it can be shown that, that this is the, the ground state of the Hamiltonian um, uh, that I just introduced. Okay, so now for this ground state, we can calculate uh, the entanglement entropy because it's a ground state for two entangled spins, okay? And um, so, so the entanglement entropy looks like this. So, and um, you either sum over the degrees of freedom of one or the other spin, uh, it's symmetric, okay? So, but um, we just calculate the von Neumann entropy with the density matrix for this simple system. So it's a pretty straightforward calculation in quantum mechanics. And uh, it's actually the case that whatever um, unitary transformation we apply to this ground state, the entanglement entropy will not change. It will always be the same. And we can actually calculate what it is. It's given by this expression, depending on this parameter alpha, which is defined in this equation here. And now one statement is that although the entanglement entropy will be the same for all of these unitary transformations, and in fact, the Berry phase will, will not be. Um, okay. And uh, so here now let's um, calculate the Berry phase in slightly, slightly mathematical terms. So um, we, we use the so-called Maurer-Carton form. Okay, so this is a connection on a group manifold. And so in our case, our group manifold is just SU2. Okay, we are looking at a very simple example. And then for any group element in this manifold, uh, we can define this form. And this is actually a mathematical way of writing the Berry phase that I introduced to you earlier. And uh, so then the Berry connection, uh, let me just go back to this slide uh, to show again how it was defined. Uh, if we use this mathematical language, um, the Berry connection is now uh, the ground state expectation value of this malware carton form of this object here for a given uh, group element of our SU2 group that we have now. Okay, and now um, um, for, we can just plug in our group element, which is uh, the unitary transformation that we have been considering. And then uh, we know what uh, our unitary transformations are and we can and we know what the ground state is so we can just calculate this by put, plugging in so we can we, we plug in psi zero that looks like this we plug in u which is a combination of these two transformations and then we can just calculate everything and we get this expression here which depends on lambda which is this parameter which uh, fixes um, the transformation of sorry what was it? Transformations, the, the fixes the transformation of the second spin in terms of the first spin. So this is just some parameter that we choose. And it also depends on these variables theta and phi, which span our SU2 manifold. Okay. And uh, so this is the result that we get. And then from the Berry connection, we can calculate the Berry curvature, which is just the field strength associated to this um, gauge field. And again, we can just calculate it. And um, so now the, the field strength tensor associated to this Mara Carton form uh, is the so called Kirillov Kostan symplectic form, which just means it's the exterior derivative of this field. So essentially, in physicist's language, this is a field strength tensor. 
And we can just calculate this and then we get this expression here. And uh, so it, this was a constant which depends on the interaction strengths and the magnetic field. So these are the parameters on the SU2 group manifold and lambda was this parameter which distinguishes the two transformations. Okay, and then, uh, sorry, we, we can also calculate the Berry phase, which is then this integral over this uh, Berry curvature. And this is the result that we get. And so we see that uh, previously for different lambda, we were getting the same entanglement entropy, but now for different, since this result depends on lambda uh, for, for different unitary transformations, we get different Berry phases. We see that the Berry phase vanishes when lambda is equal to one. Okay, but for all other values, um, this, this gives a non trivial result. So now that's interesting for, for experimental realizations because we have states that share the same entanglement entropy, but nevertheless have different topological nature. Okay, so that, that's kind of uh, interesting phenomenon. Okay, so that's what I, I stated here. So two states, um, the ground state and this unitarily transformed ground state have the same entanglement entropy, uh, but a different very phase. Okay, so the, the, and this may have experimental consequences. Okay, so uh, for instance, this can, this is a structure which, which can be measured. Uh, we suggest to measure in our paper using this approach of quantum tomography for which there's a review um, uh, in, in this paper, for instance. And uh, so the idea is to reconstruct quantum states uh, using measurements on an ensemble of identical quantum states. Okay, so and in this way, the density matrix of um, this quantum state can be reconstructed. So um, here, this is just an example, which is unrelated to the answer before, but for instance, if you have a state which has such a, a superposition with some phase here, uh, this alpha is not the same alpha as before, it's just some uh, example, other example, then it's possible to, for instance, measure this product of uh, Pauli matrices, and, and that allows to reconstruct the phase of the state. So, and so what we suggest in our paper is to combine the measurement of um, the, the phase of the state with the measurement of the Berry phase and um, uh, see this relation between the entanglement entropy and, and the Berry phase. Okay, and uh, so, um, so this is what our colleagues from condensed matter physics suggest what one could do. Um, so the idea is to have a simultaneous measurement of the very phase and the entanglement, and that involves an interference between original and um, rotated state for an ensemble of identical quantum states. And potentially this can be achieved for a hydrogen, hydrogen atom in a magnetic field, as I, this was the motivation for the Hamiltonian I considered. Uh, it can also be used, studied using NMR. Uh, one can conceivably measure this in quantum dots coupled to an optical cavity and also in superconducting quantum circuits. Okay, um, uh, so this is just some uh, nice quantum mechanical model where we calculate the entanglement entropy for two spins that interact with each other. So the important point that is that there's two spins that interact and are entangled with each other. Okay. Um, and so then, but then we show that the same structure of the very phase that we just discussed um, also appears um, for, for wormholes in ads -CFT. And so um, I think it would be very interesting if th there were, was a measurement of this um, phenomenon because then we could say we, we realize a real realization with, well, we realize a, con a connection between entanglement and very phase that wormholes will also display. Okay, let me, in view of the time, I will go a little faster over this because um, this is just saying the same thing again in a slightly more mathematical language where we use these CP1 spaces, um, but essentially this is just a, re a rewriting of the argument that I just gave in terms of um, uh, some other variables. Okay, so, and, and so there's this issue whether the space is factorized or not. 
Okay, so if we just have one spin here and one spin there, and they're not integral with each other, uh, then we have a product Hilbert space structure, but now for this entangled uh, space, actually the ground state, the Hilbert space for the ground state is much more complicated than just such a factorized one. It's non-factorized and 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 uh, that's um, um, also a feature that's very relevant for wormholes. Okay, uh, let me very briefly mention some um, very simple wormholes in quantum mechanics according to this paper of Hermann Berlinde from last year. And so he's studying partition functions of simple quantum systems. <coughs> And then uh, sometimes um, these simple quantum systems, which in, whose classical analog is written in terms of some generalized coordinate in momenta with a particular symplectic form. Uh, so this is the, just the classical definition of the symplectic form. Um, sometimes they have this property, which also arose in this case I, I was mentioning at the very beginning, that this symplectic form is not exact. Okay. And in that case, the partition function has to be evaluated in, in, on this entire disk. So, so not just on this thermal circle here. Okay, that's the thermal circle here, the boundary, but on the entire disk. And um, so there will be an integral over the symplectic form over the entire disk, and then another uh, in term at the boundary over the Hamiltonian. Okay. And okay, so if the some next structure were exact, then we can write omega as d alpha, and then uh, this uh, by Stokes' theorem, this integral over the symplectic form becomes an integral over the boundary. But uh, if the symplectic structure is non-exact, uh, we cannot do this, and we have to work with this entire expression that that is written here. And uh, this could also happen, for instance, um, with just more uh, wormholes of more complicated structure with not just two ends, but say four ends or you know a large number of ends uh, ends as, as is depicted here. Okay, and then the partition function for uh, this wormhole with n ends uh, would be the integral over this entire surface that is shown here. Okay, so and then what we did in our paper is so this is a kind of um, formal uh, derivation of this non-factorized structure of wormholes. But um, what we did in the paper was to really realize this for space-time wormholes. And there we use this ER as EPR conjecture, which uh, states the following. So assume we have a global ADS, um, um, ADS2 space. So we have one quantum mechanical system sitting here at this boundary, the right, right one. And then another one sitting here on the left hand side. Okay, so the left one. And um, so this proposal suggests that <clears throat> we have, um, uh, so if two states here are, are connected by a geodesic, <clears throat> then they are really a pair forming a, a so called thermophile double state. <laughs> So, what's a thermophile double state? You just assume that you have a basis of states. Um, and here on the right hand side and another one on the left hand side, and they are related by this uh, anti Hermitian operation, theta dagger. <clears throat> and then a sum of your double state is a state where you combine them together with uh, this particular factor. <clears throat> and um, so now this is a pure state, but which has the property that if you trace over one of the two systems, you get a thermal density matrix for the other one. Okay, so that's how this thermal field double state is really, uh, constructed. Mm. And now in this example, um, in, in holographic duality, uh, um, the suggestion is that this sum of field double state where I have one state here on this side and one of, on the other side is realized uh, by a geodesic linking these two points, okay, holographically realized by linking the two points. Now the reason there's a blue line and a red line here is um, because um, because there's a symmetry which corresponds to the time evolution. And so again, there will be a, a phase symmetry here at the boundary, and that will lead to a very like structure, a very phase structure, very similar to what we had before. Okay, I think I will just quickly show what we have and then ask for some questions. So uh, let me go to an appropriate 
picture. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so now uh, we can assume that we join. So this is a flat space here and, and a flat space there. The boundaries of this wormhole structure. And now just assume that we uh, join these two sides together. And then uh, we get the space here with the left and the right side. And then they're linked by a wormhole that we can see here. <coughs> and then, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> <clears throat> we can actually calculate a very phase <coughs> um, by integrating once around this loop. And uh, so it's in this case, it's more like a winding number here, um, actually. And but then we can show that this very phase and the entanglement uh, given by this um, line here, which is an extension of the Rio Takanagi result to, to in the case of global ADS. Uh, they will share the same properties. Um, so there will be precisely the same relation that while the entanglement entropy is the same, uh, the very phase can be different if we look at different unitary transformations there. Okay, so that's essentially the upshot of, um, of this calculation. Good, um, so let me um, go to the end and um, um, and then ask whether there's uh, some questions about this part. Um, so <clears throat> we looked at very phases for wormholes and quantum mechanics, and there's a striking similarity between the structures, although the quantum mechanical model is weakly coupled, so it's not really a duality in the sense of ADSFT, it's just a mathematical similarity between the two cases. And um, so it arises from applying different unitary transformations on the two sides. Uh, so either on the left and right hand spin or on the two sides of this wormhole. And uh, the upshot is that the entanglement entropy is the same for different very phases. And uh, so in the simple quantum mechanical model that I discussed with you, um, there's also such a non-exact symplectic form. And so the non-factorization that is seen in wormholes is now also seen in this very simple quantum mechanical model. And uh, so, so one plan would be to uh, generalize this to, to higher dimension, for instance. Okay, I think I should uh, stop here probably and, and ask if there's any questions about this part of the lecture. Uh, hello, I have one question. Yeah, sure. Uh, indeed, uh, your result precisely want to say that if we entangle entropy is the same, but that it's possible to have the different basis. Now, I, I recently, I think uh, the Bartek also defined a different very basis, but that it can, dis uh, can, can be obtained from a de entangled degrees freedom. Why say that I can classify states from the Bartek's very phase and also standard very phases? Ah, okay, a uh, very good question. Um, let, maybe you can, let me go back to the slides. <clears throat> and uh, uh, okay, sorry. Can can you so so you're asking um, why can I classify with different different very phases if the entanglement is the same? Was this the question, or can you just? Uh, well, uh, I, say, I know that that's why you can classify a stay from yeah. a Copy and also the very faces. But I want to yeah. say that whether I can change this statement, because uh, Bartek can also use the uh, entangled degrees freedom to define the yeah. new uh, very faces. Then could I use the Bartek's very faces and the standard very faces to classify the states? It means that I, I wonder whether if the state has the same entangled entropy, then Bartek's very phase is also the same for two states. Yeah. Okay. So in this sense, I can if this is true, I speculate that we can generalize this statement to any qubit state. I say not just for two qubit state and also for the n qubit state, and then we can yeah. use the two very phases to do the proper classification. Is this ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so you're absolutely right. I mean, there's some different type of, I mean, here, when I say very phase, I always mean the very phase with respect to magnetic field, okay? Yeah. But you are also, but you're absolutely right. We can also define a very phase with respect to the entanglement 
uh, structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, yeah, it's yeah. A These thing. are two very good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent question. So, so these these are two different things, and um, 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 it's true that here we only focus on on the magnetic uh, berry phase. Okay, the berry phase with respect to the magnetic field, and um, we 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 link this with this entanglement structure. But um, it's it's a very good question which we didn't address yet. If there's also, I mean, if we use this berry phase. Uh, just essentially on this Schmidt sphere, okay, of, of the entangled spins. If if this is uh, related to that one, I, I would think they're different at the beginning. Uh, but um, I mean, this is certainly something that should be investigated more. Yeah. Thank you. A very good uh, question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, anything else? <laughs> no. So where you are integrating over this very phase? Uh, okay, let me sh share the screen again. Uh, um, so we are integrating, okay. Yeah, we're integrating over theta and phi. Okay, so uh, let me go back. Um, um, so let me go back to the model. So, okay, so we have two spins, okay? And they interact with each other. So, and they're entangled. So we have, for each of them, we have a, a sphere uh, which is parameterized by theta and phi, okay? But then um, we consider, we just deliberately choose a case where uh, we rotate uh, one by a different number than the other one, which is parameterized by this uh, lambda. So I am asking whether you are integrating over sphere or total sphere? Yes, we are integrating over the sphere. Okay, so so these integrals they are integrals over theta and phi. Okay, so they're integrals over, so where was my theta and phi? Yeah, over this theta and phi, okay, which which span SU two manifold, okay. Um, however, I have such a sphere for each of the two spins, but I consider them uh, to be linked in such a way. So I was wondering, uh, maybe I didn't understand something. So because uh, f is a and I'm mean, integral over uh, f is just the chain number, isn't it? Just a yeah, yeah. This is the chain number. Yes, number. Correct. Yeah, and this is why, the why it is not quantize the value, but um, it's uh, it depends on the parameter lambda and alpha. Okay, alpha is just the constant. Okay, so I think lambda and alpha are just parameters of the entire calculation. Okay, so, so and I fixed them at the beginning. So alpha, okay, so again, look at my model. So I have a, an interaction term with a coupling J and here is the magnetic field. So, and then alpha just uh, is a combination of these two. So that's fixed. If I fix my Hamiltonian, that's alpha I cannot change, okay? But alpha appears here in, in, in my ground state. I, what I'm asking is, uh, chan number, if we, you are integrating over just a two-dimensional, I wonder. Uh, yes, I'm integrating over theta and phi. I'm not integrating over all over uh, uh, space. Then shouldn't it be just a, a, a integer number? Maybe I am missing something here. Mm. Uh, well, I think that would probably be true if you have a free theory, but so so this alpha parameterizes the interaction with so okay. I think what you have in mind if if I have I think what you have in mind is um, the simple example that I mentioned in the beginning. Okay. So here I have only one spin. In, in the magnetic field. So there's no entanglement because I have just one spin. And, and then if you integrate here, then I think it's right, you get an integer. But now we have this 
add additional interaction on top of it and that modifies because now we have two spins okay and because we have two spins um, there's a modification of this uh, original result and and so the interaction enters via this parameter alpha and uh, and then we have another choice which is the relative um, orientation of the two spins uh, spins that interact with each other and which is parameterized by this lambda. Okay, so I think my answer to your question is that what you are saying is true if we have just one spin in a magnetic field, uh, but now I have um, I have two spins that interact with each other and are in the magnetic field, so it's much more complicated. Uh. I see. So maybe uh, what you are doing is uh, you are iterating over subsurface uh, of the entire configuration space. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we integrate over theta and phi. Okay, so you're right. I mean, in principle, okay, so maybe I should go to the thing I jumped over. Um, so the, the, the entire Hilbert space of what we're looking at is a CP3, okay? But mm -hmm. In, in, I'm not integrating over the surface of the entire CP3. I'm, I'm integrating over um, a, a subspace which is uh, obtained by this particular uh, orientation of the field in, in, in this, uh, of the two spins in the magnetic field. Okay. Right. So, yes, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, very good question. Yeah. I have a very general question. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, you told, yeah, you told us this very extensive topic from very different aspects. And mm -hmm. what is your outlook about uh, this holographic condo physics? Uh, how the things will develop, and uh, also, uh, what are the most interesting unanswered questions from your perspective? Okay, very good. Yeah, I think for, for concluding, we should definitely address this question. Okay, so so um, I think there's more formal and more applied aspects. Okay, so yes. um, I, I tried to allude, I mean, I, I presented this one model extensively and I mentioned that, you know, we got inspired by this top-down approach, but, um, you know, there were little issues which we kind of just disregarded by going back to this bottom-up model. And uh, so now we have this more recent model based on this D1, D5, which I just mentioned very briefly. And, um, but there everything is much more under control um, because all the orders of N match and so on. And we really have a nice top-down construction of a duality with such a defect flow, okay? And um, for that model, uh, we have only this one paper so far where we actually wrote down the model, but we didn't do anything with it. So, so now with this much more, one model much more under that control, then um, then we can um, again study applications and so on. This would be one thing to do. Um, and um, then uh, coming back to this bottom up model, I think I, I alluded to this at several points. So so the the feature of this model is that it describes the interaction of a. Um, of an impurity with a strongly correlated electron system, which is different from the original condo model. And in, in condensed matter physics, this is studied by using Lattinger liquids. So there's also condensed matter models of Lattinger liquids in, interacting with the spin impurity. And so far, it's a bit unclear how what we are doing is related to those approaches. And I think that's something that should be worked out and would be very nice. However, that requires a slight generalization of our model, which I mentioned that so far we didn't consider the electrons to be propagating. Okay, we, we just took this trans Simons term. But if we if we want to see how, how they, um, um, if you make want to make statements about the spectral function of the electrons, for instance, we have to replace this trans Simons term by a young Mills term. And then we have to, of course, resolve the equations of motion and, and everything to, to, to get the spectral functions of the electrons. But that, okay, so, so uh, one answer to your question is, um, it would be very nice to work out the exact relation to, to this um, 
uh, condensed matter approaches of having natural liquids with spin impurities. In what sense is what we are doing related to what they are doing? Okay. So that's something immediate. Okay, there are some technical issues about you know looking at propagating electrons and so on. But I think this is something that can be done. Then one interesting question is: Can we use this to solve something that condensed matter physicists can't solve? And then the immediate thing would be a, con a condo lattice, obviously. So then the question is: If we can we also do the same if we have several um, spins? And so Andy O'Bannon had one paper where he looked at two spins. Okay, rather than just one, uh, with some interesting features. But then, um, so so you know, in, in condo lattices, there's this competition between the magnetic interactions and uh, the condo interactions, um, and so there's phase transitions and so on. But for condensed matter physicists, this is very hard to solve. And and one hope would be that by extending this to to several um, um, lattice sites, we could possibly do something there. I mean, then of course we don't have the spherical symmetry anymore and we have to go to higher dimensions, but going to higher dimensions in, in ABS-CFT is not so complicated as going to higher dimensions in, in conformal field theory. Um, so, 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 I mean, one of the motivations that we really wanted to do is to look, if, can we say anything about condo lattices? In, and the only, okay, so there's this paper by Andy O'Bannon about two spins, but I you know the next step would be good beyond, beyond two spins. Um, okay, so the immediate applications are uh, connection to large liquids in condensed matter physics, and um, you know, can we say anything about condo lattices? And then, uh, you know, in, on a more formal level, more investigations about about um, boundary RG flows, uh, perhaps based on this new model, which we proposed two years ago. Uh, then, of course, the the, the things that Marty's mentioned they, they are also very topical as you know there's you know there's lots of studies of bcfts in the context of this island physics in, in um, uh, quantum cosmology or adscft for black holes and so on and and that's now there's many many applications of uh, uh, boundary conformal field theories and so i think yesterday there was a paper by tatashi takayanagi about precisely this and so on and I think that this condo model gives a lot of techniques which can be used in this context, which nobody used so far. Okay, so there, there would also certainly be many interesting things to do in that context. Okay, so I hope that <laughs> this gives an overview of interesting things to do. And, uh... <laughs> uh, is there any further questions? This is last chance. <laughs> okay, yeah. anyway. I yeah, right. It was a uh, very uh, good, I guess, uh, uh, motivating talks. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your very, uh, I guess, uh, good summary about your extensive works. So I had uh, some motivations to look at some of them. Yeah, so. thanks. And thanks for your questions to everybody. And uh, I hope that, you know, they, they were very pertinent and I hope I managed to get things more clear. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful that you were interested in this very interesting piece of physics. And uh, okay, I will definitely also look at this paper by uh, Zed, Jeff, uh, Sentiv and Voita again to, to really understand uh, what's going on there and the symmetries and so on, yeah. No, I really enjoyed this as well, and I'm, I'm very grateful that you invited me, and a uh, good continuation to everybody. And yeah, I hope I will come to Korea in the not too distant future. <laughs> Again, maybe, yes. please. Yeah, let's see. I mean, uh, well, I mean, one day, you know, COVID has to be over. I mean, <laughs> it's, mm. it's gonna go on forever. <laughs> yeah, it was very illuminating lecture, and easy to follow even uh, people who know nothing about quantum physics, like me. And okay, thanks good. for that. Yeah, maybe Jungi wants to say something as an organizer, as a closing speech. Uh, I, I would like to thanks. Yeah, again, yeah, thank you for a very uh, nice, uh, great uh, talk. And uh, and I also thanks everyone uh, to uh, attending the workshop. And uh, uh, is there something more, Sangjin? Uh, do you have anything more to say? I just wanted to thank you to all the organizers and also to the speaker. Thank you very much for all of your effort. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for listening on, uh, uh, and 
being a lively audience. That was a lot of fun. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye -bye. Yeah. Hey, bye. we'll see you soon. Yeah, bye bye. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Sandrine. <laughs> <laughs>